Hey folks, so this video is going to help you explore uh, some of the things we didn't get to before midterms, which is to do like a force analysis on things that are moving in circles. So by force analysis, we just mean a free body diagram followed by Newton's second law. Uh, so in this video, we're going to explore three things. Uh, one is when friction is causing the net centripetal force. One you've explored, and that's the tethered mass. So when a string or tension is causing uh, the centripetal force, and then one that only appears in free body diagram and not like math problem zones, which is a banked turn. So we'll get to that one last. Um, so this is a video for like those of you who are ready to move on. Uh, you have learned in class about how to use the normal force uh, when we're talking about centripetal motion or circular motion. Uh, so like cars going over dips or into into dips in the road. Uh, over hills and then like roller coaster loop the loops uh, and there are variations on on those but that's kind of covering all of normal force so we're going to start with friction and so what you need to imagine in this example is that this car I drew the license plate this car is going into the page and I put an X here because this is the center of the circle and so what we are going to imagine is that this car is taking a right hand turn and staying the same distance away from this location in space. So the car actually like is driving into the page and it drives in a circle that goes like under my desk and comes back up here and then goes around again, uh, as if it's in a rotary in, in England. Um, so the, the like idea here is that the car is going to need to accelerate in that direction. And so it's a centripetal acceleration. And we're just going to analyze the free body diagram and then see what Newton's second law would have to say. So as far as this goes, I think like if you are strict with your rules for free body diagrams, things go pretty easily. Uh, we want gravity to be the force that is down. And so that's kind of always we want to do that. Uh, and that means the normal force pushes up on the car. And then the thing that's really important is to note, like, when you are driving, driving a car and you turn your wheel, um, you are, like, changing the direction with which the, the ground pushes on your car. And when you turn your wheel, the ground starts to push you uh, toward the center of the circle you're about to travel in. And so because the car needs to accelerate toward the center of the circle, there has to be a force or a force component that is pointed toward the center of the circle. So that is uh, the complete free body diagram. There's no force that points out of the circle. Um, and this force of friction is uh, static friction. At least you hope it is, because what happens is if you take a turn and you instead get kinetic friction, then you start to slide out of the circle. Um, and so that force of friction, we're going to assume for now, is the force of static friction. And so we're just going to look at, like, what does Newton's second law say about this? So I don't have a specific problem, but I want you to be prepared for just like anything. Uh, so we have centripetal direction, and then the other direction is the y direction. So when you're analyzing things in circular motion, uh, the first direction that you identify is the centripetal direction. It's always toward the center of the circle. And then if you have forces in other directions, it's just whatever's left over. It could be x, it could be y, um, but just pick one that makes sense. So as far as the centripetal direction, it's pretty simple. There's only one force in the centripetal direction, and that's friction. And that's going to cause uh, centripetal acceleration. So we've already learned that centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. And so we can apply that to Newton's second law. So this is good, right? If you want to just talk about the force of friction, what it says is the more massive your car is, uh, the, the bigger the friction force will need to be to keep you in that circle. With friction and, and roads, we talk about like a, a limit. Right, like how fast can you go without skidding or sliding? Well, the um, faster you go, the bigger the friction force has to be. Um, and so let's like dive into that a little bit more. Instead of the force of friction, 
I want to talk about the coefficient of friction. So the next thing I'm going to do is say that according to this diagram, it's pretty clear that the normal force is equal to the force of gravity. Now we also know that friction is equal to mu times the normal force. Now when we talk about static friction, we have to talk about the maximum force of static friction. So um, if the car causes the maximum force of static friction, then the car stays going in a circle. If the car causes less than the maximum force of static friction, then the car stays in the circle. And you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between those two because static friction always delivers whatever it needs to to prevent there from being sliding. But if the speed you go at would end up exceeding the maximum force of static friction, then you start to slide. So here's how we work with that. So this, this part should be familiar, that the friction force is equal to mu times the normal force. And so because the normal force is equal to the force of gravity, I can make this little expression for the force of friction. This will pop up a lot in this course even still that we've already covered friction. So I can substitute the friction force is going to be mu mg, and that's equal to mv squared over r. Uh, and so what we're assuming is that we're going to have this car cause the maximum force of static friction. Um, there is a mass on both sides, meaning in every term of this equation. So I can divide both sides by m, and that goes away. And then I can solve this for V, and I want to talk about why I'm solving it for V. Um, what you end up having is this expression. Now, the problem is not always going to be about this specifically, right? It could be about mu, it could be about G or R, uh, but I'm going to pretend it's about speed. Now, this equation is something that like governs friction when you're turning a car. Um, and this speed would represent the maximum speed without um, slipping. Although in your car you call it skidding. So the value of root mu g r is whatever that value is, the maximum speed that your car can travel in that specific circle without starting to skid out of the circle. Now it's defined by mu and g and r. So on Earth, that's a constant. Mu depends on the road and your tires, and even the condition of the road and the condition of your tires. If your tires are older, then mu is smaller. If the road is brand new, mu is larger. Uh, if it's raining, mu is smaller. If it's icy, mu is very small. Um, and it's also defined by the radius of the circle. So if it's a really big turn, it's a really big radius, you can go really fast. Um, but if it's a smaller and smaller turn, you can't go as fast and avoid slipping. Um, and so this equation would come up for any standard like turn in a car um, where you're moving in a circle. And so whatever the problem is, you would need to like go through this analysis. But here's one example of how it turns out. Okay. Next up is the tethered mass. Um, you've done this one already. You had a lab on this, but we didn't go over it. So I want to just move through this um, and talk about like strategies because I'm going to ask you to do a lab later in the unit that is going to be a trickier version of the tethered mass lab. So tethered mass is something that's like it's okay you have an object with mass it's connected to a string and someone or something is holding the string and the object is moving in a circle which means that the string like moves in a way that it's kind of tracing out a cone where the, the object is at the base of the cone, and then the, the sides of the cone will convene at your hand. Um, this diagram, I took it from your packet, and I modified it a little bit, but there's an angle to the string. So the, the idea behind a tethered mass is that that angle of the string is constant. It has to be constant because otherwise the object won't move in a circle. Now, um, that angle appears in your free body diagram like that. Um, and this is another example in physics of alternate interior angles. So like this dotted line here is vertical. And then I can just move this vertical line over here. If I drew another vertical line there, 
I'd have this would be parallel to that dotted line. And so this angle here would be the same angle that is there. So that's where theta comes into this diagram. Um, now there's all sorts of other things about this, right? Like there is uh, a length of string. And so any tethered maths problem probably gives the length of the string. And so if you don't know the angle, then you can use the length of the string and maybe the radius to get the angle. If you do know the angle, you can use the length of the string to get the radius. And so you have a right triangle of distances. It's really important to keep that separate from your right triangle of forces. So I think it's probably worth drawing these two triangles, which are definitely the same, like they're similar triangles. They have all the same angles, um, but they uh, should not talk to one another, meaning you shouldn't put a force in this triangle and you put, shouldn't put a distance in this triangle. Uh, if you wanted to add a third side to this triangle, it would be the height of the, basically like the person's hand above the circle. So length of the string is the, the longest measurement, the hypotenuse. The radius is, is inside the circle from center to, to outside. And then H would be what I would use as like the height of the, the cone that is being made. The other um, triangle would make a rectangle um, with this triangle because there are similar triangles. They have to have the same angle here and here. This triangle is for the tension force. And so the tension force has two components. And so that's what I wanted to analyze here. I'm going to go kind of quick so you can pause and, and go back if you need to. Uh, but if I go and look at what Newton's second law says, I have to have a centripetal direction. Now in this free body diagram, uh, or in this picture, you can see that the ball is here, and that means that the center of the circle is over here. So in the free body diagram, the centripetal direction is to the right, which means that my other direction is going to be in the y direction. Now we have to assume, especially because we're in like a high school physics course, that the net force in the y direction is zero. If it's not, then this circle is not consistent, and we have something other than uniform circular motion. So that has to be zero. All right, so back to the centripetal direction. If I look at this triangle, the part of tension that is in the centripetal direction uh, would be written as Ft sine theta, and that's equal to mv squared over r. And so maybe I can answer some questions about that. Um, you can think about like how the variables would change. Um, one of the big ones being like if I pull with more tension, then the effect is that the mass will go faster. The circle will also change, right? The, the more tension I pull in, the like further up this circle moves, which means the radius will also get bigger. Um, so that, that happens. So I'm going to imagine a scenario where I'm going to kind of give you hints about what you're going to do in your next lab. I'm going to look at the Y component because I have forces that are in the Y component. There's a, f a component of tension that's pushing up or pulling up, and it's supporting the mass. Uh, I would write that out as Ft cosine theta, and that would be equal to mg. Now, um, you can do whatever you want with the triangles. Like, my diagram has theta here. Uh, you could put it there, or you could also put theta down there. But you have to remember to be consistent, because if you pick this angle, but do the right trig if, as if it were this angle, then you've just used the wrong angle to do all your tricks. So you need to make sure that the, the angle you have, that you know where it is in your triangle. Um, and so I just want to point out that this uh, equation, each equation has tension in it. And I can eliminate tension. So I can say uh, the force of tension according to this y component uh, equation is equal to mg over cosine theta. I can take that and I can put it in this equation. And I get mg sine theta over cosine theta equals mv squared over r. Um, and so that's like... I guess a hint. Uh, and I think what I want you to see is that we're doing a lot of algebra 
that leads us to substitutions. And so you want to like be able to do that because some of the, the concepts happen after you do that. Um, and so, you know, I would let you continue this. If you wanted to like look at this equation and try and solve it for V, you can see a couple of things that will happen. So that's the analysis of the tethered mass and you can take any part of this and work with it to solve some different problems. The last one is banked turns. And this one is like by far the most complex, but they actually say in the course description that like you'll need to be able to draw a free body diagram and like talk about it intelligently, but you will not need to do any uh, like computation with it because of how complicated it is. So basically a banked turn is if you watch like car racing, um, you probably know that there are lots of racetracks that are not flat, that they're banked. And the cars are seriously tilted when they take a turn. The, the straightaway part might be flat, but as soon as they start to take a turn, the, the car actually like start, the, the ramp starts to tilt and it tilts the car. And, um, and I think it's like Daytona might be one that has one of the most severe angles in all of car racing. I think it's like 30 degrees or something like that. So it's like really, if, if you see someone, there's videos of you like walking down it, it's like a really steep hill. But cars drive on it like this, as if they're driving straight into the page again, and this car will be like taking a right turn. Now, very critically, the center of the circle for that car would be at the level of the car. And what that means is the way that you would analyze this is not exactly the same way that you would analyze an inclined plane. So let's like dive in and see what we have. So the free body diagram would look like this. There would be a normal force pointing out at an angle and the force of gravity would be pointing down. Now, um, the, the reason why you have banked turns is that cars can go much faster on those turns uh, without the aid of friction. And so on a regular turn that we just talked about in this video, uh, if a car takes a turn, it relies on static friction to help it make the turn. A banked turn can allow the normal force and it can actually allow the, the road to support the car in the turn. Now, if the car goes extremely fast, then there might be a force of friction pointing this way. And what's really crazy is, um, sorry, no, let me back up. If the car goes really slowly, right, it could actually start to like skid down the track. It wouldn't do that because there's like the coefficient of friction on a, on a racetrack with the tires is huge. But if the car's not going fast enough, then it could require friction to hold it up. On the other hand is if the car goes extremely fast, it would actually require friction to prevent the car from sliding up the ramp. So friction could point up or down the ramp for a different reason than it would happen on an inclined plane. Uh, but we're just going to focus on, on these two, the normal force. So the diagram's kind of messed up, but that's okay. What you learn from the, the inclined plane is that we use theta to as the angle that gravity deviated. But we can't do that because the center of the circle is even with the object. In other words, the acceleration of this car has to be directly to the right, which means that gravity is kind of in a good position. Gravity is not going to help that acceleration happen. It's a component of the normal force. So the same logic we applied, the angle of incline used to be the angle that gravity was tilted. But for a banked turn, it is now the angle for which the normal force is tilted. And so what I wanted to show you is without friction, this works out just like uh, the tethered mass. In the centripetal direction, we have the like horizontal component of the normal force. And in the vertical direction, we have the vertical component of the normal force balancing out gravity. Now, if you like flip back to the thing you just did with the tethered mass, you'll see that if I just wrote FT instead of FN, the equations are identical. 
Um, so what you need to know is like sometimes there could be friction. And so if there's friction, if you look at this diagram, friction is also at an angle, right? Like friction would be along this line, whereas the acceleration is there. So the, the value of theta would be relative to the horizontal, whereas for the normal force, it was relative to the vertical. So you are not required in AP Physics 1 to like do a mathematical analysis of banked turns, but you might be required to like look at these diagrams and draw some conclusions. And that is that.